think we'll get started and people can trickle in as we get moving. I think there's a lot to get through here tonight um, from what I've seen in the intros. Um, thank you all for coming to this Music is the Word event, um, welcoming the University of Iowa School of Music to the downtown Iowa City starting next fall. Um, really briefly, I just wanted to share how this came about was I was at a UNESCO City of Literature Beer and Books event um, seated next to Anna. I knew peripherally about her and like an hour later, I got a full lecture um, about <laughs> Dostoevsky and all the Russian greats, and there was music talk interspersed, and I thought, I was in the midst of planning a lot of these events going on, and I thought, I'm getting her phone number, she's doing something, I don't know what it is, but we'll figure it out. And um, she, I said, we'll find some Russian pianists, um, someone who could play Russian pianist music, and uh, so I talked to University of Iowa art chair, Leslie Finer over there, and she connected us to Sasha. Um, and I gave them each other's phone numbers and said, go to work. And if you know Anna, it became what you're about to witness, <laughs> which includes opera, uh, piano, live readings, um, and a little bit of ballet. So let's get to it. Uh, welcome everyone, well, let's welcome everyone that's going to be helping tonight.
was inspired by Spanish dreams. Um, and of course, the, um, the first image that you were looking at while Sasha was playing is the um, Piazza de España, the, the um, square dedicated to all things Spanish, and there is nothing more Spanish apparently than Cervantes, Don Quixote, and Sancho Panza. And this year we're celebrating the 400th anniversary of um, the birth of the complete Quixote. Volume two was published in 1615. Um, there are so many books that um, were birthed in the aftermath of Don Quixote. Um, and many critics would say that even such books as Flaubert's Madame Bovary were inspired by Quixote because poor Emma read way too many books and it goes to her head. Um, some critics could say that um, the travels or the adventures of Huckleberry Finn in American literature are very much so a quixotic book, a quest across America that allows the main character very leisurely to go through a large landscape and hear other people's stories. Um, or a book like Travels with Charlie of Steinbeck, where he actually uh, travels around America in a camper named Rocinante. Um, but Quixote, um, as an influence, has been with us for 400 years, and uh, Quixote's contribution to many things in Russian culture is quite tremendous. So in this um, one hour, um, we're going to focus on several works that were actually um, written as an homage to Don Quixote and to Cervantes' Cervantes's marvelous masterpiece. Um, Rodion Chibrin um, wrote this composition in the 20th century. Of course, he's still with us, which is remarkable. Um, and um, he was married to the Russian um, ballerina, Maya Plisievskaya, um, who sadly passed away not so long ago. And one of her most famous roles was the role of Sikri in the Russian ballet Don Quixote. So many of you may have seen um, the ballet Don Quixote by um, Ludwig Rinkus based on this wonderful ballet. And this incident actually does take uh, place in the, in the ballet. Ludwig Minkus was a German composer who lived in um, Russia and he wrote for the Russian Imperial Ballet. Um, the, the ballet was first performed um, in um, 1869 at the Bolshoi Theater and the choreographer for this ballet was of course Mario Savitov. So there is nothing more Russian <laughs> than the ballet Don Quixote. Um, the, the ballet plot involves both incidents from volume one and incidents from volume, volume two, the marriage of um, Sikri to Camacho and then eventually to Basilio, an incident that um, occurs in the second volume of Don Quixote is the most important um, overall plot of the ballet. And then there are many incidents included, um, such as the windmills and um, um, partly the, the image, the vision that he, the Quixote said has in the Cave of Montesinos. Um, one of the most famous melodies from the ballet is the dance of Sikri's friends, and Sasha is going to uh, give us a taste for, for that particular part. <laughs>
versions of Don Quixote the Ballet. Um, the original version was choreographed by Marius Petipa. Um, the, um, the version that um, is well known in the United States is of course George Balanchine who choreographed himself as Quixote and Susan Farrell as the Ketri slash Dulcinea, the beautiful image of the woman that Quixote was in love with all his life. Um, there's also a very famous version that Mikhail Baryshnikov did for the American Ballet Theater. And if technology cooperates, we're going to uh, watch a little segment of it um, right now. And of course, Quixote approaches, uh, Basilio gives Ketri a flower, and Quixote approaches completely mesmerized by Ketri, who appears to him as his vision of Dulcinea. And there he is. Take that, Basilio. <laughs> Going back to our lovely PowerPoint. Um, so, musical Quixote is not the only Quixote that we discover in 19th century um, Russian culture. And the one man who contributed to the um, intrusion of Quixote into Russian cultural life was Ivan Turgenev. And he had very personal reasons to be absolutely madly in love with all things Spanish. And of course, it is. It had something to do with a woman. That woman was Pauline Garcia Villarreal. Um, can you imagine this absolutely gorgeous Spanish French opera singer performing Mozart on the St. Petersburg Imperial stage? Um, just all of you have to transport yourselves into 1843. She's 22 years old, he's 25. He sees her on the stage and he's completely smitten. This is the 25 year old young man who has a philosophy degree from the University of Berlin. He's a wealthy Russian landowner, and he will remain smitten with her for the next 40 years of his life. In 1883, he will die in her arms in Bougival near Paris. This 40 years of collaboration with Pauline Viardot was hugely influential on both Russian culture and the exposure to Russian culture abroad. Because of her, um, Turgenev lived in Paris most of his life, or Baden-Baden, um, with Chosu folk. And um, she wrote a number of romances based on Russian poetry. Turgenev, of course, learned Spanish impeccably. He already spoke French, English, and German um, as a native speaker. Um, he, he learned Spanish and he read Quixote in Spanish. And Quixote became a huge influence on his writing um, from the mid 40s on. Um, so in that sense, this uh, program is dedicated to music and literature. 
And this is the perfect fusion of music and literature. Pauline Viardot actually said some of his poems to music. Um, her music teacher was Franz Liszt. She played duets with Frédéric Chopin. Um, her family brought Don Giovanni to America. Um, her father was an impresario. His sister was Maria Millebron, the wonderful opera singer who died too young. Um, and Pauline also wrote five opera. Um, the libretti of three of them were provided by Gauguin. So this is, this is the perfect fusion of music and literature. And um, now we'll invite um, Rachel Josselson to perform two romances for us. The first one by Pauline Viardot is based on a poem by Pushkin. The second one will be based on a poem by Turgenev.
the first one was we heard was based on a Christian poem. The second one was, was based on a Turgenev poem. And this is actually a sketch made by Pauline Viardot of Turgenev. This is what he looks like when they first met. So this is the 25-year-old Turgenev sketched by the 22-year-old Pauline Garcia Viardot, um, a love story for the ages. Uh, Turgenev, of course, was 12 during the revolution of 1830 in um, France. And then the revolution of 1848 and 49 um, really ignited the imagination of so many young men in, um, in Russia and in Europe. Um, this was a time where the heroic was still very much so present in the consciousness of all the Europeans. And yet they started seeing the re re results of heroism that were not working out so beautifully all over Europe. So it was a time of tremendous aspirations and tremendous tragedy. And Turgenev, um, when he starts writing the five important novels that he created, and one of them, of course, is Fathers and Sons, that was written in, 80, uh, in 1863, um, his first great novel was a novel entitled Rudy. And it's about um, a young man, Luke Rudy, who em embodies the spirit of the 19th century intellectual. He is part Hamlet, part Don Quixote. Completely introspective, completely agonized by the knowledge that he has. And um, unable to act, um, attempting to aspire to act, uh, but unable to act within the confines of 19th century reality. Um, my um, dear friend Margaret Higginson is going to read to you two passages from Rudy. In one of them, he will aspire to be like Quixote and in the second passage, and I need to make a disclaimer, she is going to read the last page of the novel so you know what happens at the end. <laughs> but it's very important for us to know what happens um, at the end in order to proceed with the program. Finally, she struck six and drew them into form that day. She began hurriedly making him his goodbye. Then they were to part also. He comes expectantly to the eager cart in this way as if he were being driven out. How did it all happen like this? And why all this rush? Still, it's the same in the end. Just what he thought as he bowed on all sides with a forced smile. He glanced for the last time at Natalia and his heart gave a jump. Her eyes were directed at him in sad farewell reproach. He ran briskly down the steps and bounded into the Tarantas. Lazitov volunteered to accompany him to the first post station and sat down beside him. Do you remember, began Rudin as they began to drive out onto the highway lined with fir trees. Do you remember what Don Quixote said to Sancho Panza after leaving the Duchess's court? Freedom, Quixote said. My friend Sancho is one of man's most precious possessions and happy is he to whom he ha heaven has given a crust of bread who has no need to be obliged to another man for it. What Don Quixote felt then, I feel now. God grant that you also, my dear Bazitov, should experience this feeling sometime. Bazitov squeezed Rudin's hand and the honest young man's heart beat strongly in his grief-stricken breast. All the way to the post station, Rudin talked about the nobility of man and the meaning of true freedom. He talked passionately, ennoblingly, and in a spirit of truth. And when the moment of parting came, Bazistov could not contain himself and threw himself on Rudin's neck and wept. Rudin also shed a few tears himself, but he did not weep about parting from Bazistov. His were tears of self-pity. This is the end of the novel. In the midday heat of 26 June 1848 in Paris, when the rising of the national workshops was already being suppressed in one of the narrow streets of the Faubourg Saint Antoine, a battalion of the regular army was taking a barricade. Cannon fire had already smashed it. Those of its defenders who remained alive were abandoning it and thinking only of their own safety when, suddenly, on the top of it, 
and the broken body of an overturned omnibus. There appeared a tall man in an old frock coat with a broad red scarf tied round his waist and a straw hat on his gray, disheveled hair. In one hand, he held a red flag. In the other, a blunt, curved sword. And he was shouting something in a strange, high-pitched voice, scrambling up the barricade and waving both the flag and the sword. A Vincennes sharpshooter took aim and fired. The tall man dropped the flag and fell face forwards like a sack, just as if he was falling at someone's feet. The bullet had passed clear through his heart. Look, called one insurgent to another as they ran from the scene. The pole is killed. Wow, said the other as they ran into the cellar of a shuttered bullet talk house. The pole was Dimitri Rubin. Hamlet who cannot repose the Natalia, who has to leave in the Tarantas for the station, filled with self-pity, into a quixotic character who dies on the barricades of 1848. Um, all of our dreams come true, right? Um, he is an old man when he dies on the barricades. He is not 22. He is not a character from Le Miserable. He is an old man who feels that if ever there was a moment in his life to act heroic, it is now. And Turgenev is fully aware of the implications of writing that scene. Of course, this is the image that we all know so well and love so well. It's Napoleon at the bridge um, of Arcole. And I always show this image to my students because this is the image that inspired the last um, 10 pages of volume one of War and Peace of Tolstoy. This is, of course, the moment where Andrei Balkonsky, Tolstoy's character, is actually left in seeing. Um, and I always tell my students, if you walk across that bridge under enemy fire and, live and, and, and get shot, you're an absolute idiot. But if you walk across that bridge under enemy fire, um, holding the banner of your regiment high, you walk into history. And this moment of the heroic was omnipresent in the minds of all of those young men who fought all of those revolutions in France um, in 1830, all over Europe in 48 and 49. And... Um, and then once again in France in the 1860, 1861. Um, Turgenev continues to develop this notion of the heroic and introspective in the 19th century in a lecture that he gives actually in 1860, just a few years after writing his novel Rudin. So in so many ways, the novel Rudin is his uh, exemplification of the dichotomy between the introspective Hamlet type and the active and heroic Quixote type in the 19th century. And this lecture, which he entitled Hamlet and Don Quixote, actually explores the notion of the polarity between these two character types in 19th century literature. And um, Marguerite will read a passage from Hamlet and Don Quixote. To repeat, the Don Quixotes invent, the Hamlets exploit what has been invented. Someone may ask, how can the Hamlets exploit anything when they doubt everything and believe no one? My reply is that nature administers our earth so adroitly as to permit neither thoroughgoing hamlets nor full-fledged Don Quixotes. These are simply extreme expressions of the two opposite tendencies. Life steers towards one or the other of these extremes, but never reaches either of them. It is well to remember that, just as the principle of analysis of scrutinizing and probing into everything is extended in Hamlet, Hamlet to the limit of tragedy, so in Don Quixote, enthusiasm is stampeded to the opposite order of comedy. In reality, one seldom meets with either unalloyed comedy or utter tragedy. Thank you. Um, Obviously, Don Quixote becomes the inspiration for yet another Russian novel, um, but not only Quixote. Um, Dostoevsky, when he is visiting Basel with his wife, Anna Ligurina Dostoevskaya, goes to the museum and he sees this painting. 
It's a very painful image to look at. It's the image of the dead Christ. It's the Saturday between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And um, Dostoevsky will be so shocked by witnessing this painting in Basel that Anna Grigorina Dostoevska, his wife, will write in her diaries that she had to drag him out of the museum because she was worried that he will have an epileptic fit um, after witnessing this painting. And what Dostoevsky does then is he combines the image of the quixotic and um, combines the image of Christ and he writes a novel. Um, it's a wonderful image by Kittle. Um, and he writes a novel called The Idiot. Um, and The Idiot, or Lev Nikolaevich Mushkin, um, the main character, becomes for Dostoevsky the embodiment of both Christ and Quixote in the here and now, in the world of 19th century Russia. What he feels are the similarities between these two characters is their abiding goodness. Um, even um, uh, an author like Lev Tolstoy in his, uh, in his treatise on art, entitled What is Art? He will say that Quixote belongs to um, a world of literature that is universally good. Um, and um, he also puts someone like Jean Valjean into that category too, as the perfectly good human being. Um, for Dostoevsky, Quixote becomes the embodiment of action in a world um, that is populated by human beings and characters who are morally imperfect. Um, it is um, notable to say that that revolutionary movement that inspired uh, Turgenev and that inspired Turgenev to send his character Dmitry Milugin onto the barricades of uh, Paris in 1848, that was the revolutionary movement that swept up the young Dostoevsky, who in 1849 was arrested in Russia for his revolutionary activity and as I just said earlier, for his crime he was. So um, that quixotic moment of Rudin standing on the barricades in so many ways was Dostoevsky's quixotic, um, very much the revolutionary activity for which he paid with 10 years of severe introspection. And he came out of Siberia a very chastened human being. Um, could be compared to Lazarus, he got a second chance to live. Um, and he really felt that human beings are conflicted in their attitude towards the heroic. Um, he felt that human beings are ridden by doubt, and that was the best thing about us. Um, because doubt leads us to, um, to suffering, and suffering leads us to consciousness. And so these ideas were embodied in the novel The Idiot, which was very much so inspired by both um, the notion of the good Christ, the Christ who forgives and loves all, but also by Quixote who acts in the name of goodness. Um, Rodrigo is going to read to us two passages um, from Don Quixote and two passages from The Idiot that were inspired by those particular passages in Don Quixote. I then, since it is my fortune to be counted in the number of knights errant, cannot help but attack all things that seem to me to fall within the jurisdiction of my endeavors. And so, it was my rightful place to attack the lions, which I now attacked, although I knew it was exceedingly reckless. Because I know very well what valor means. It is a virtue that occupies a place between two wicked extremes, which are cowardice and daring. But it is better for the valiant man to touch on and climb to the heights of daring than to touch on and fall to the depths of cowardice. And just as it is easier for the prodigal to be generous than the miser, it is easier for the reckless man to become truly brave than for the coward. And in the matter of undertaking adventures, your grace may believe me, Senor Don Diego, it is better to lose with too many cards than too few, because this knight is reckless and daring. Sounds better to the ear of those who hear it than this knight is timid and cowardly. Thank you. And we're going to look at an image of the Pavlovskaya Palace under St. Petersburg where the novel The Idiot is set. Um, in the particular image, in the passage that was inspired by um, Quixote's statement about cowardice and courage. Um, in The Idiot, um, a character whose name is Aglaya Yapanchina, very impressionable young lady, 
She's advising the main character, Mushkin, about how to load a gun. She wants him to be brave and daring. She wants him to be the hero of her ideals. She wants him to be quixotic in the everyday. The prince murmured something in, in embarrassment and jumped up from his chair. But Aglaya immediately sat down beside him, so he sat down again, too. She looked him over and then looked out the window, as if without any thought, and again looked him over. Maybe she wants to laugh, it occurred to the prince, but no, she just laughed then. After a pause, Aglaya said, Maybe you'd like some tea. I'll tell them. No, no, I don't know. Well, how can you not know that? Yes, listen. If someone challenged you to a duel, what would you do? I meant to ask you that earlier. <laughs> but, but who? No, no one is challenging me to a duel. Well, but if somebody did, would you be very afraid? I think I'd be very afraid. Seriously? So you're a coward. You. No, 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 no. Maybe not. A coward is someone who is afraid but doesn't run away. But someone who is afraid but doesn't run away is not a coward yet. And you wouldn't run away. <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't. I'm a woman, but I wouldn't run away for anything. And anyhow, you're clowning and making fun of me in your usual way to make yourself more interesting. <laughs> Tell me, don't they usually shoot from 12 paces? Or sometimes 10? Doesn't that mean that you're sure to be killed or wounded? Uh, people must rarely be hit at duels. Rarely? Pushkin was killed. That may have been accidental. Not accidental at all. They fought to kill and he was killed. No one aims to hit a man where he did. So the bullet most likely hit Pushkin accidentally from a bad shot. Competent people have told me so. But I was told by a soldier I once talked with that according to regulations, when they open ranks, they're ordered to aim on purpose at the half man. That's how they say it, the Half man. That means not at the chest, not at the head, but at the half man. <laughs> Later I asked an officer and he said that was exactly correct. It's correct because they shoot from a great distance. And do you know how to shoot? I've never done it. Do you at least know how to load a pistol? No. No, I don't. That is, I understand how it's done, but I've never loaded one myself. Well, that means you don't know how, because it takes practice. Listen now, and learn well. First, you've got to buy good gunpowder, not damp. They say it mustn't be damp, but very dry. The fine sort. You can ask about it, but not the kind used for cannons. They say you have to mold the bullet yourself. Do you have pistols? No. <laughs> And I don't want any. Nonsense. You must buy a good one. French or English. They say they're the best. Then take some powder, a thimbleful or maybe two thimblefuls, and pour it in. Better put in more. Ram it down with felt. They say it absolutely must be felt. You can find that somewhere. You can get pull it from a mattress or from a door. We have upholstered uh -huh. doors that are made of felt. You, you have to do it that way, and then you, when you've stuffed the felt in, you put in the bullet. Do you hear? The bullet after and the felt, the, the, the bullet after and the, and the felt before. Otherwise, it won't fire. Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? I want you to shoot several times a day and learn to hit the mark without fail. Will you do it? The prince just laughed. Aglaya stamped her foot in vexation. Her serious air in such a conversation surprised the prince a little. He partly felt that he had to find out about something, to ask about something, in any case about something much more serious than how to load a pistol. But everything flew out of his head, except for the one fact 
that she was sitting before him and he was looking at her. And what she talked about at that moment made scarcely any difference to him at all. Um, the passage that Moiter read to us right now occurs in the middle of the novel, and um, um, Mushkin is in love, um, and Aglaya is frustrated that he's not the hero of her tales. Um, it's fascinating that uh, when we read a passage from Rudin, um, the young man on the barricade mistook Dmitry Rudin for a Polish man. That's why they say uh, the Pole was killed. There were so many Polish revolutionaries in Europe, and it was very romantic for women to fall in love with Polish revolutionaries. Um, there were Italian revolutionaries too, but for that you have to go to Stendhal. Um, it's fascinating that at one point in the novel, Aglaya actually falls in love with what she thinks is a Polish revolutionary who ends up not being a revolutionary and not a count at all. Um, Aglaya is frustrated because she sees a world where women are traded for money, both in lower society and in high society. Aglaya is frustrated because her aspirations for the heroic are not realizable in the world where she lives. So even though Mishkin is her ideal man because he is good, and his goodness represents itself through his love of absolutely everyone, through his acceptance of absolutely everyone as they are, he's not heroic in the quixotic sense. And we're going to listen to two more passages. One, um, once again, from Don Quixote that talks about knights errant and chivalry, and a second passage where Aglaya in The Idiot actually talks about the quixotic in her world. I only devote myself to making the world understand its error in not restoring the happiest of times when the order of knight errantry was in flower. <coughs> Excuse me. But our decadent age does not deserve to enjoy the good that was enjoyed in the days when knight at knights errant took it as their responsibility to bear on their shoulders the defense of kingdoms, the protection of damsels, the safeguarding of orphans and wards, the punishment of the proud and the rewarding of the humble. Most knights today would rather rustle in damasks, brocades, and the other rich fabrics of their clothes than creak in chain mail. No longer do knights sleep in the field subject to the rigors of heaven wearing all their armor from head to foot. No longer does anyone with his feet still in the stirrups and leaning on his lance catch 40 winks, as they say, as the knights errant used to do. Now, however, sloth triumphs over diligence, idleness over work, vice over virtue, arrogance over valor, and theory over the practices of arms which lived and shone only in the golden age and in the time of the knights errant. And now the final passage that we'll read today is Aglaya's um, invocation of the heroic in her world, in the world of 19th century Russia. Aglaya suddenly and unexpectedly declares, there isn't any foolishness, only the deepest respect. Her mother responded. First they laugh lamentably, and then suddenly the deepest respect appears, raving people. Why respect? Tell me right now, why does this deepest respect of yours appear so suddenly out of the blue? Aglaya went on seriously and gravely in answer to her mother's spiteful question. The deepest respect because, because this poem directly portrays a man capable of having an ideal and second, once he has the ideal of believing in it and believing in it, of blindly devoting his whole life to it that doesn't always happen in our times. In the poem, it's not said specifically what made up the ideal of the poor knight, but it's clear that it was some bright image, an image of pure beauty, 
And instead of a scarf, the enamored knight even wore a rosary around his neck. It's clear that it made no difference to this poor knight who his lady was or what she might do. It was enough for him that he had chosen her and believed in her pure beauty, and only then did he bow down to her forever. And the merit of it is that she might have turned out later to be a thief. But still, he had to believe in her and wield the sword for her pure beauty. It seems the poet wanted to combine in one extraordinary image the whole immense conception of the medieval, chivalrous, platonic love of some pure and lofty knight. Naturally, it's all an ideal. But in the poor knight, that feeling reached the ultimate degree, asceticism. It must be admitted that to be capable of such feeling means a lot, and that such feelings leave a deep, and on the one hand, a very praiseworthy mark, not to mention Don Quixote. The poor knight is that same Don Quixote, only a serious and not a comic one. At first, I didn't understand and laughed, but now I love the poor knight and above all, respect his deeds. <laughs> so Aglaya concluded, and looking at her, it was hard to tell whether she was speaking seriously or laughing. <laughs> Sasha suggested actually that last piece and was written by Dmitry Shostakovich also on Spanish themes. And we can have a whole new program on Shostakovich, I suppose, because he was part Hamlet, part Don Quixote, like most 20th century Russian intellectuals in the Soviet Union. Um, at this point, we would love to invite all of our participants to come to the table and we would love to answer any questions that you may have. Sasha, oh, what is the name of the show? Get fly. Oh, okay. 
That is about Italian revolutionaries too, right? Yeah. So yes. Yeah, about the Bergen. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Is it Clementine? That's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Any questions? Any comments from the participants? I loved it. <laughs> yeah. There is some, and there is, there is so much more. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable to what extent we have this one novel. And somebody asked me why Quixote and why was I, um, I was the person who organized the public reading of Quixote and we read the entire novel. It took 42 hours and it was so much fun. Um, and I've been doing these public readings for six years now. We started with Anna Karenina in 2010. And so many people ask me, why have you meandered over to Spanish literature since you don't speak any Spanish? And I told them, well, first of all, because I love everyone in the Spanish department so much. We had, we had a lot of fun, fun partying together, but also because Quixote was so influential in 19th century Russian literature. Um, I mean, the idiot is Dostoevsky's homage to Quixote and uh, Turgenev's, all of, all of Turgenev's writing was infused with the idea of the, um, tortured intellectual such as Hamlet and um, the quixotic, heroic types such as Don Quixote. And uh, you can see these characters in all of Turgenev's novels from, uh, um, from the nest of the gentry folk to fathers and sons um, to on the eve. And of course, Rudin is his homage to Quixote and to Hamlet. Oh, I, I see all of my students who have read the, the Demons or The Possessed. There are two translations of that novel bowing their heads and saying yes. Um, Stepan Verkhovensky is in big trouble because he's sort of the resident intellectual of uh, uh, Varvara Stavrogina who uh, actually designs his little outfit that he wears on her country estate. So he's very much though this inept um, resident country intellectual, but he has that past of having written a risque political poem when he was very young, and he's terrified that that will come back to haunt him. That's really his greatest crime in the entire novel. But then, um, but then the young generation shows up, and his son and Barbara's son, um, the, the two young men embody in themselves the, the recklessness of the revolutionary spirit. And what happens in the second part of the novel um, is very much though a testament to um, what was happening in Russia in the um, 1960s and 1970s. When I, when I teach that novel, I always talk to the students about the 40s liberals and the 60s radicals, and I always have to preface that by saying that I'm not talking about the United States in the 20th century. I'm talking about Russia in the 19th century. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's profound. I mean, there's a character in that book later on who gives a speech at a literary at a literary party, um, and he's pounding the podium as if he's crushing the heads of his invisible enemies, and he looks exactly like Lenin. He's short and bald, bald and he has a little beard, and, and he's an absolute demagogue. Um, Dostoevsky knew what revolutionaries are all about because he was one of them. So he was the cured, chastened revolutionary who became this prophetic philosopher um, who absolutely warned absolutely everyone that nobody Nobody listens to writers. <laughs> no, absolutely. And uh, The Demons is a novel that he writes right, right after he finishes The Idiot. Mm -hmm. um, earlier than the 1850s on? Probably, and um, you know, Sasha and I had um, a fun discussion about this about three weeks ago, to what extent there was so much Western influence on Russian culture um, after the times of Peter the Great. And um, Peter is an extremely controversial character, you know, the great reformer for some and an antichrist for others. Um, but he really introduced um, Western European ways, modes, into the Russian tradition in the early 18th century. So we have the entirety of the 18th century that is hugely influenced mostly by French culture. Um, his daughter Elizabeth, uh, Elizaveta Petrovna, um, she loved everything French. And so by the time we get to the late 18th century in Russia, 
Um, the aristocracy speaks French, wears French, eats French, listens French, reads French, watches French. It was completely, completely um, um, Frenchified. Um, and then 1812 happened. And 18 held, uh, 1812 was the big wake-up call for, uh, for Russia because um, the Napoleonic invasion made the Russian aristocracy realize uh, that if the French are invading, then the French may not think of them as French. Um, and there are humorous moments in War and Peace where the Russian aristocracy plays these little games where if um, somebody at a party cannot remember a word in Russian, only in French, they have to pay a fine, and then that bucket of money is sent to the front. Um, absolutely ridiculous. Um, but then much larger influence happens in Russian culture in the 19th century where Shakespeare becomes extremely prominent um, as an influence. And Sasha may want to add to that. Um, to to all, all the influences that happened in 19th century and earlier. Yeah, well, I I agree that the, the most most European influence was happening rather in like late 18th and 19th century. And so we um, uh, what uh, Anna was um, mentioning about uh, Peter the Great is. Is is true because he's quite controversial <coughs> figure. He br yes, he did he did brought he did bring the European culture, and he almost not almost but literally forcefully um, demanded to wear no beards and that that kind of thing. So all the all the nobility had to shave their beards, which they didn't before because that was not part of part part of Russian culture, and so. And along with those things, he, he he was burning a lot of books which were existing before, before he is, uh, he he got to uh, into the king's king's chair in in Russia. Uh, the, a lot of uh, Slavic books, uh, old ancient information, old ancient culture was destroyed by him, deliberately. So we don't know exactly how much. Uh, like how much benefits it brought to Russia and, and how much uh, destruction. Um, but definitely that unique blend which happened uh, after um, in, in 19th century, we, we have uh, established very close ties be, with, 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 with France and, um, and Spain and other, and Germany that was all um, very beneficial for, uh, I mean, that the cultural exchange was, was definitely and Russia uh, is not extraordinary. Really Russia is not really considered a European country till 1815, till the Congress of Vienna, where uh, Clemens Metternich basically organizes a meeting of all the European heads of state after the Napoleonic Wars, and he realizes that Russia has to sit at the negotiating table because they were the ones who destroyed Napoleon. Um, and so after 1815, Russia becomes a paramount European power, but at the same time, in Russia, moving away from European influences starts happening very early on um, in the 1820s and 30s and 40s. And a poet like Pushkin, um, he was a translator from French, English, Spanish, um, German, Greek, and Latin, and he brings many of those idioms into the Russian language from all of the languages. He enriches the Russian language tremendously through his translations, and his poetry is um, unsurpassed in, in the Russian language to this day. Um, but he existed in the, in the generation right before Turgenev. But it's fascinating that you know Turgenev belongs to the three bushy-bearded Russian novelists, Turgenev, Dostoevsky, and Tolstoy. It's fascinating that beards and Russian ways come back into fashion in Russia um, after the revolutions of 1848, 1849. In the 50s and 60s, Russians start lo looking for Russian roots and start discovering post-Europeanization, what it means to be um, Russian. And of course, Tolstoy takes it to the extreme where he starts wearing peasant clothes and um, um, he does not trim his beard. <laughs> Any other questions? I think um, untrimmed beards is a good place to end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.